Hi there, killer. Ah, that's great. Okay, <laughs> we got it working again. Just wait for some more people to pop in. Hi, Alistair. Hi, Jared uh, Mac. Should we say part two? <laughs> yes. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. It seems to be working a little bit better now, so apologies for that. <laughs> I put another 50p in the meter. Um, okay, welcome back, guys. So let's continue with this. So as I said, as I was saying before, before I was rudely interrupted by myself. Um, do we start? Do we start an hour starting from now? <laughs> no, don't worry. Um, so. Back in 2016, John Major saying how the, the Tories wanted to privatise the NHS. And now this year, there's talk of having private ambulances. So you'll actually, if you want access to an ambulance, you can either wait or you can use a private ambulance and you'll get to hospital a lot sooner. Now, you're, you're not going to get full, the same treatment as you would with a normal ambulance. But this is, this is just shows how the, the, the NHS has been so run into the ground that it's even even when it comes to ambulances, there's going to be one for the private sector and one for everyone else. The concept that uh, the people running the Brexit campaign would care for the National Health Service is a rather odd one. I seem to remember, Why? well, Michael Gove wanted to privatise it. Yeah. Boris wanted to charge people for using it. And Ian Duncan Smith wanted a social insurance system. The NHS is about as safe with them as a pet hamster would be with a and hungry python. A new private ambulance service offering patients the opportunity to be seen quicker it takes to the road this week, but it's only available for those who are prepared to pay for the service. Critics say that's unfair and could lead to better, faster care, but only for some. Sam Reid reports. You always have it in the back of your mind how much better it would be if we could just be there sooner. From a small part of Hertfordshire around St Albans, you can call between 10am and 10pm and they hope to get to you in around 20 minutes. They want to expand to the whole county. If I want one of these ambulances, I call up, give my credit card details and pay £99. <laughs> you know, we, we thought this was a joke in the US that people would actually have to pay for an ambulance or would, you know, it would cost them a fortune and people would actually avoid they would go by taxi to the hospital because they say look i can't afford the 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 cost of having an, an ambulance and here we have it here we have a, a part of of britain part of england where people are being asked for credit card details before the ambulance arrives but if it turns out i need further services the cost will rise the bill for going to hospital is still being worked out but the total could end up being around 450 pounds the firm says clinical staff answer the phone and they won't respond to what are known as category one or two calls, strokes or heart attacks. Dave is the boss here. Who is this for? Yep, you're right. This isn't an emergency service and this is urgent care. And I think the ideal patient is probably like my mum or my dad. <laughs> my mum had a fall um, and she didn't realise it was that bad. Or maybe it's a parent worried about their child. They just want them checked out. It sort of puts people in a position that, again, if you have more money, you get services quickly. And this is the opposite of what the NHS should be. The NHS should be free for all. And instead, what, what you've had over the last 14 years is you have uh, a, a Conservative Party driven by ideology to either to, to run it into the ground so that there, so more and more people will, re will rely on the private sector or just to sell off parts of it to their mates. Um. They're, they're against, they were against the idea of the NHS from the beginning, and now they've pretty much privatised all of it. Now, what's going to be interesting is what's going to happen when Wes Streeting is in charge, because it seems that he's quite close to the private sector. And he's mentioned before how it makes sense to rely on the private sector. Uh, Alistair, thanks so much for that super chat. Uh, quicker to quicker to the hospital in A&E but sit in a queue yes so it's not going to it's not going to make any difference if you're um if you're going to just sit in a queue waiting to be treated because there isn't a private hospital that you're going to be taken to it's just you're going to jump the queue now it's understandable that some people are having to wait hours for an ambulance and some people if they have the money we're going to 
spend 400 quid and and jump the queue but there shouldn't be a queue the the, re- the reason why there's a queue is because there's so many problems in social care which is creating a backlog why are there so many problems because the government are not interested in funding social care they're not providing councils with the money they need and councils are having to dip into um, smaller and smaller funds to cover costs like uh, social care and the care sector is struggling to recruit the staff it needs uh, because of pay and conditions but also because of brexit and because of the pandemic uh, Alistair once again thanks so much uh, for that super chat this is a patient transport not an ambulance max yes it's it's a it's a sort of glorified taxi uh, where you pay a lot of money but in a sense you are jumping the queue because you'd be brought to hospital well, if you had to wait for a, you'd be brought to hospital sooner than if you were to wait for a normal ambulance. But the normal amb- ambulance should be arriving within the time necessary, but it can't because it's not able to discharge people. It's not able to, um, it's not able to meet its targets because of all the problems that the Tories have created. Um, just to, taking over more ambulance drivers and paramedics into the private sector after training in the NHS. Yes. The NHS has paid for the training for all, all of these ambulance staff and now the, the private sector is taking advantage of the situation. And it's, you know, why isn't this front page news? Why is this something that's covered, you know, on this, on social media? It's, yes, it's a BBC report, but very few people are talking about it. I only discovered it through uh, Farouk who posts stuff on social media. Given Rishi's understanding of how to make a payment, <laughs> he'll be no good in an emergency. <laughs> well said. Uh, Jack, hello from Holland. Welcome, Jack. It's it's insane. It's absolutely nuts. Sticking with health. Um... Next step will be private entrance to the A&E. Well said, Jared Mack. Yes, this is what the Tories will... That's the Tories' ultimate goal, is to have everything privatised. So here, here's the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, tells Sky News, a fair and reasonable settlement has been found for NHS consultants in England, bringing an end to a year-long negotiation and strike action. Well, I'm really pleased that following some really intensive negotiations with the unions representing consultants, we've been able to find a fair and reasonable settlement for consultants, but also, of course, for patients and for the taxpayer. So I think this is really good news. This means that consultants will be able to continue their very, very important work in hospitals up and down the country looking after patients. So if you were able to come to, the, come to an agreement, why didn't you come to an agreement before? Why did you have this back and forth going, we're not going to meet them, we're not going to meet them, we're not going to meet them? And then you eventually realize, well, we actually have to do something about this because if we don't, then going into the general election, there will be strikes and people are going to go, wait a minute, why why should I vote for the Conservative Party when there's chaos in the NHS? So I I think this is a cynical move, you know, play the play the ideological role for a bit and then realize actually what we need to do is we need to we need to give we need to come to some sort of agreement with the consultants like once again the the consultants shouldn't have to go on strike they went on strike in order to achieve their goals they receive they 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 achieve their goals means that they are getting better paying conditions but you could have actually given this at the beginning and then there'd be no need for them to go on strike and and of course them going on strike have a knock-on effect in other parts of the NHS, and it ha- impacted people's lives. Once again, when when people blame the doctors for going on strike, there's a reason why the doctors go on strike, and there's a way, and and it's up to the government to stop them from going on strike. How do they do that? By providing them with the be- with good pay- paying conditions. The doctors and nurses don't go on strike because they want to have a luxurious lifestyle and you know, massive salaries. They want reasonable pay and conditions because most of them are there out of a love for the NHS and a love for care. They want to provide, uh, they want to provide their skills in the best way possible. They, they care about saving lives and making people's lives better. They're not there. Most of them are not there for the money. They're there because 
they had a calling. So in order to stay in that job, they need to be able to pay their bills, feed their family, and they need to have reasonable paying conditions. Because if they wanted loads of money, they would just keep they would just stay on strike until they got that. But that's not what they're that's what that's not their goal. So once again, when the government say, well, you know, the waiting list has increased because of strike action, you're responsible for the strike action. You can end the strike action tomorrow if you want it. And we've seen she she has ended the strike action because she's given in. She's told them, OK, here are better paying conditions. Um, the UK is out of the EU and its economy has been wrecked by 14 years of Toryism. You can no longer expect a lifestyle of a developed European country. That's, yeah, it's it's a hard truth. The Tories have destroyed everything over the last 14 years. So private ambulances is sort of the way to go. Not in the sense that that's the way to go, but that's the reality of life now. And I think it's going to be difficult for Labour to undo a lot of these things because these things are going to become normal. You know, um, a crumbling NHS has now been normal normalised, but under the Tories. So it's going to be very difficult to undo that. Uh, staying with this, now I, I want to move on to this interesting story. Let's jump uh, jump about a bit, but this is a really interesting story that um, maybe it'll. Uh, it caused some people to think. The star of the show are the tomatoes. So. so UK farmers call for a universal basic income as they struggle to break even. Now, so just to give you a bit of a background, what is a universal basic income? The idea behind a universal basic income or UBI is that you give everyone a, a basic amount of money to live. Uh, Daily Blase, great to see you on the stream tonight. Hope you're well. You give people a basic amount of money to live in order to cover bills, pay rent, pay whatever, feed themselves, for everyone, forever. And there's no strings attached. So it's universal, it's basic, and it's an income. It's quite simple. And the idea behind it, of course, is that as society changes, as new technology comes in and it takes away people's jobs, AI is taking people's jobs as well. In order to maintain a civil society and stop you know, stop it collapsing into chaos and anarchy. You need to provide people with the means to live. And a UBI provides that. Now, a UBI, I believe, is a stepping stone to something like, you know, a future like Star Trek, where we don't actually need money. We don't need, we don't have to rely on money. But, you know, before we get there, we still have to <laughs> use money. But a, a way to achieve uh, a civil, you know, a, a society where people don't have to worry about, okay, can I pay the bills this month or am, am I able to feed my family? It requires a floor that people don't fall below. And it, imagine for a moment, you know, a, a UBI of a thousand pounds a month for the rest of your life, no strings attached, not means tested. So it goes to everyone. Okay, this is the general idea of a, of, a, of a UBI. People will criticize, well, you don't want to be giving rich people a UBI because they don't need it. The, the cost of creating some sort of means-tested system undoes the, the value of a UBI. So you lose money. Well, in a sense, you're not losing money because you're giving the money to the rich people. They can give it to charity if they want. They can put it in the bank account. They can just spend it on whatever. But actually to create a means tested system where you stop rich people from receiving it is actually more expensive than if you were to just give it to everyone. So it makes more, makes sense just to maintain the universal aspect of it. And it would create a situation where people are allowed to, you know, to live their lives. People want to spend more time with their families. When, when, during the pandemic, when many people were working from home and not having to go into the office, they realized, wow, this is really nice, actually. I'm able to get up in the morning, spend a bit of time with my family, instead of you know sp spending two hours stuck in traffic or sitting on a bus or on a train. I'm able to spend a bit more time you know, doing things that I like, hobbies. I'm able to you know leave the computer, go and have a coffee or watch TV for a moment or you know, walk the dog or spend time with my family or whatever uh, and then get back to work and not have it not have to sit in traffic or travel or anything like that and this you know increase inc it improved people's quality of life not for everyone and it's not possible for everyone but star wars is mince <laughs> um but it, it's it it creates a situation where people are more free 
free to do things that they want free to spend more time with their family M many people don't want to spend time with their family they would prefer to be in the office but that's that's an option that's available so let, let enough jibber jabber from me let's get into this story about a universal basic income for farmers these have grown way faster than i was expecting this year even once she sold all this produce alice says she barely makes enough money to break even i've had a lot of farming friends this last year give up because and it's not because they didn't love farming and it's not that they were pas not passionate about it it's just they had to go back to desk jobs because they couldn't afford to support themselves that's crazy it is ridiculous that we're having to sacrifice things as farmers in order to grow food to sell at ridiculous prices she's part of a group called basic income for farmers demanding agricultural workers get a guaranteed wage a, a basic income would mean that farmers were able to have a little bit of paid time off they were able to have some maternity leave some sick leave and some I agree 100% with this idea. You know, because if we think about farmers, we think we we think of, think of farmers as well. They work in the field and they collect the plants or whatever. They collect the crops. They feed the animals, whatever. Um, if you actually know anyone who is a farmer, they will tell you it's a 24-hour job, seven days a week. If you have animals, some of them may be sick. They need to be. You need to be monitoring them all the time. If you're growing crops, you need to be con continually out checking that. You know that they're watered enough that they're receiving enough fertilizer weeding stuff like this wa watching out for pests uh, fungi things like this and you need to be it's it's a full-time job and you you know you can't take time off you can't go on holiday in a sense um and and it's more and more difficult to be a farmer because of the higher costs that they're facing and and they're constantly trying to deal with supermarkets that are wanting to cut prices more and more some rest so that they can give everything that they've got to the farm in the future. The campaign group says a huge number of UK farms were only able to stay afloat thanks to EU subsidies and they're worried that the government's scheme to replace that cash doesn't go far enough. Add that to pressures like inflation, the cost of energy bills, seasonal workers and pressure from supermarkets all mean farmers are really struggling. Last month, the go-slow convoy of tractors drove around Westminster in protest about the handling of post-Brexit trade deals. And there are fears the more our farmers come under financial pressure, the worse the impact on the environment. Farmers are there to care for the biosphere, to produce good food, nutritious food, to care for the animals. But they've been pushed down this corridor of, of in order to survive they got to make more and more money and that means that the biodiversity has suffered um livestock has suffered it's been cruelty to animals and things so we're in a mess right now the department for environmental food and rural affairs said we firmly back british farming and are fully committed to maintain spending an average of 2.4 billion pounds a year on the farming budget across this parliament in england but campaigners say this issue is about more than just putting money in the pockets of farmers. It's about where our food comes from, how it's produced, and how much it then costs once it hits the shelves. And if you think about it, if you provide a UBI to farmers, they'll be able to sell produce a lot cheaper because they won't be constantly trying to undercut themselves or undercut others. So I, I, I'm fully behind this idea, and I, I don't know what amount of money they're talking about, but you know, the, the EU subsidies are gone. And the EU subsidies, in a sense, is a bit like a UBI. It's a guaranteed amount of income that would be, gar that we, that's given to farmers in the EU. And, um, you know, they know that they're always going to receive this subsidy. While in the UK, because of Brexit, well, they're no longer receiving those subsidies. And they can't rely on the Tory government and maybe even future governments to, to guarantee this. And if you want to produce, f and in, and it, it, like from an environmental point of view, it makes more sense to produce the food in the local area than to import it from abroad because the costs uh, for the environment and the costs in general are, are just extremely high. Anyway, guys, let's move on. Um, a story here uh, about conscription. <laughs> anyway, well, what's your what's what's your take on a UBI? Let me read some of your comments. Um, it's farming but not as we know it. <laughs> uh, with all the rain, uh, farmers will be uh, struggling with crops. Yeah, that's true. And if they're not able to sell as much as they could, then of course they're going to they're going to struggle. Um, it's okay that we just import food from Africa and South America. That's the, that's the Brexiteer way. That's what um, Jacob Rees-Mogg wants to do. 
just import everything from abroad. Um, hit the like button, folks. Yes, please do. 2.4 billion across 60 million people is not much. It's not. And this is the thing about these numbers. Is it enough? Of course, it's not enough. And this should be the question put by journalists to politicians when they say we're going to spend this amount of money on farmers. OK, but is it enough? No, it's not. <laughs> In Sweden, people aged 18 have to complete an enlistment form, but only some of them are called up to do basic training with military service. 100,000 18-year-olds are screened for service annually, but only about 5% of that cohort serves. Uh, Sweden say they aim to double that number by 2030, roughly. <laughs> OK, Keller, OK. Some bloke has promised to do a UBI live stream. Wonder what's happened to him. Uh, Yes, I I'll have to have a chat with that bloke. 10% of those serving do so unwillingly, with the alternative being prison. The selective form of conscription was reintroduced in 2017, following Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014. Of course, Sweden joined NATO relatively recently, didn't it, back in February. So you get screened, the best get selected, and you are mandated to pitch up as and when things kick off. So that we now have the head of the army... We have the former head of MI6 saying we really need to think about this now. And yet I still think there is a big gap between the reality they see coming down the track and I think what most of us would put up with. If you went out and said to someone this weekend, you went and met a friend at the pub or whatever, you went and said to them, oh, God, they're thinking about bringing in conscription. They'd laugh at you, wouldn't they? I, I think there would be incredulity because the reality that younger and the head of the army the thing that they see i don't think is being widely seen it's being seen in poland it's being seen in sweden it's being seen in estonia and moldova but i don't think it's being seen in the uk so someone senior with a very solid background in defense of the realm says we actually need to think now really very hard about this conscription idea and you say get stuffed <laughs> or sign me up i think most people are saying get stuffed because what's in, what's interesting is on the on the left people are saying look um i don't want to why why would i want to join up and fight for a tory <laughs> tory government and then people on the right are like oh, britain isn't isn't british enough why would i fight for a, 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 a country that's no longer british or whatever so yeah, I think it'd be very difficult to get people to sign up. Um, this guy is a clown, the LBC thing. I'm not a huge fan of uh, Tom Swarbrick. But this idea of... of look, I, I think a big problem with, with, with conscription at the moment in the UK is be, the MOD don't have the money. So one thing is, like, let's conscript hundreds of thousands of people. Where are they going to go? Like if every year you're going to have to have basic training. You're going to have facilities. The, the MOD are, are struggling with the current situation. Um, housing for, for soldiers and their families is decrepit. And they've been complaining about it. So this idea, what, what, what we're going to do is we're going to conscript thousands, hundreds of thousands of 18-year-olds or have them do military service. Um, I don't see that happening. Because there isn't the there isn't the resources available now. If there was a war on the horizon, I don't think there's a war on the horizon. But if there was, um, then it's then it's possible that there would be a political there be a consensus politically. We need to do something about it. But there isn't even a conversation at the moment. Uh, Finnish conscription on side uh, the military other. Side civil service, yes. So, so, like, once this, it was a, a case here in Italy many years ago. I think about twenty years ago, even a bit more. Um, there was military service. They eventually ended it. I think in the late nineties. Um, but the idea behind it, of course, was also that you you could join the military or you could do some sort of civil service, um, some community service. And um, many people did volunteering, for example instead of joining the military which i i think the idea behind it isn't too uh, isn't too bad um you know as long as there's the option to if you're you know if you're not interested if you're a pacifist or um you're not interested in joining the military 
in general, that you have some other outlet where you can provide some sort of service to the public. I think this is a good thing. It creates um, it creates a, a society that should, in theory, care about um, itself. Your name should be, should also go on the list. <laughs> I'm a bit too old for military service, I think. <laughs> um, Anyway, guys, let's let's move on to another story before we finish for tonight. Uh, apologies about earlier with the with the connection. It seems to be working a bit better now. So, oh my goodness, I have to inflict <laughs> Lee Anderson onto you guys. I'm sorry, Lee Anderson talking absolute twaddle from his behind, uh, talking out of his arse. <laughs> Lee Anderson saying we we need to we can ignore the European Convention on Human Rights if we ignore the European Convention on Human Rights. What would be the consequences? Okay. Parliament as a whole is, is, is out of touch with the British public, as it was during the Brexit debate. Probably three quarters of Parliament would not agree to leaving the ECHR. Look, there's a simple solution to this, Patrick. Just ignore it. Uh, and like I said before, Patrick, we could ignore the ECHR if we wanted to. We've done it mm. before on the boats for prisoners. And I always used to raise this when I was in the Conservative Party with government. You know, if we ignore the EC ECHR... Well, you know, what would be the consequences of But it's not about ignore. <sighs> it may... what He doesn't seem to understand the European Convention on Human Rights. There will be asylum seekers who could potentially take the UK, court, UK government to court, take them to the European Convention, to the European Court on Human Rights. So this... You wouldn't be ignoring the, the European Convention on Human Rights. Like... When we're talking about how do you ignore it? I, I don't know what he means by ignoring it. We just ignore it. Like it's the UK is represent like you'd have to you'd have to um, disapply it. You'd have to leave the Euro you'd have to leave the Council of Europe. That by that would be ignoring it. Of that, and I was told repeatedly that it would it would affect our standing on the international stage, it would affect our reputation. But I tell you what, our reputation is already tarnished on the, not just the international stage, but the national stage. <laughs> it's like, we've already messed up. Why, why shouldn't we mess up a bit more? We've already tr thrown our country in on, t on top of the pile, he on, the, on, the, on the pile, on the heap, uh, on the dung heap. <laughs> We've already, you know, trashed our own reputation. The Tories over the last 14 years have turned Britain into a laughing stock. So what's the point in getting another few laughs? I'm sick to death of us importing the third world culture over the channel. Some of these people on these boats coming over, Patrick, as you've reported. What does he mean a third world culture? <coughs> a third world culture. What does he mean by that? It seems that now that he's no longer a member of the Conservative Party, he can truly speak his mind. <laughs> And of course, he's not going to face any pushback from GB News because GB News is basically um, the the PR wing of Reform UK. On your show, we're going to commit horrific crimes. That's my concern, mm. and that's the concern of the British public. Now, I worked with the food bank for a, a considerable amount of time. We was batch cooking. We, we cooked 150 meals uh, from 50 quid, worked out at 30 pence. When I... When I actually said this in Parliament, I was ridiculed, I was laughed at. I asked every single Labour MP to come and join me in the Food Bank Project to have a go. This was designed to help people. And it's true, Pat. Why would you vote for things to make people poorer and then go to a food bank to try and help people feed themselves? Like, just think about that for a moment. It, it, I, I compare it to an arsonist, a bit like the Brexiteers when it comes to arson. The, the Brexiteers burning down the forest and then turning up with a shovel and a tree to say, look, I'm here to plant a few trees. Like The same with, with the food banks. You vote for policies to make people poorer. You vote against increasing benefits to people to lift them out of a situation where they have to rely on food banks. And then you go to the food bank and you do a victory lap about, look, I'm able to produce meals for 30p. The food bank buys pasta, potatoes, rice, vegetables, meat in bulk or receives it in bulk and of course they're able to produce a meal for 30p because they're people, regular people can't buy all these things for 30p. They can't cook all these things for 30p. People can't buy 25 kilos of chicken 
<laughs> like where would they store it? They, people can't buy huge amounts of pasta or rice. It would go off. It would be, you know, it go damp or infected by well, butterflies and stuff or moths or something. Maggots, something. You know, they wouldn't be able to store this stuff in their homes in a flat. This is insane. But what? But he he can put together a meal for thirty p. I'm not I'm not saying it's impossible. But if you have if you ignore certain realities, of course you can do that. But ordinary people, especially during the the time when energy bills were at the highest, people were not af- people were afraid to cook, because they were afraid if I turn on the heating, if I turn on the gas, if I turn on the electric stove, it's going to I'm not going to be able to pay the bill. I'm not going to be able to heat the rest of my house. I'm going not, I'm going to have to switch off the lights for the next few days. Patrick, there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people up and down this country that cannot cook a basic meal from scratch, from you know, from, from the ingredients. They just cannot do it. And this is a generation... I don't believe for a second that's the case. Some people may not be able to cook a meal. But we have the internet. Every, people are... For, their YouTube channels with millions of subscribers because people are interested in, okay, I want to I wanna cook a, a meal. They can find how to, how to cook meals. It, this is not the 1990s. It's nothing. This has come, this is probably third or fourth generation now of people that cannot cook. And obviously then, if they can't cook, they can't pass those skills onto the kids as a result of that reason. So, so this is Lee Anderson doing some sort of charity work. <laughs> Teaching people how to cook. It's, it's pathetic. He, he, what he does is, him and his party have put people in a situation where they have to rely on food banks, where they have to rely on food that cannot be cooked because they're afraid to switch on the oven. Or the gas, or the stove. The arsonist apolo- uh, analogy is a bad one because arsonists are capable of feeling remorse. <laughs> like Dirty P. Lee, well said, pancaking on. Yes, does it? It's a yes. Some of them can feel remorse. Lee Anderson has no remorse. He's is a shell of an individual. Can you imagine this guy used to be a labour councillor? His his uh, family, I believe were on the side of the trade unions and then something happened did he like fall down and hit his head or something (laughs) did he get kicked by a horse like what happened when lee anderson decided i'm going to be a massive you know (laughs) um i better not say the word you know you you know rhymes with jeremy hunt like what what happened that he became such a terrible individual did he get like you know did he have a, a bad? It was in a bad relationship with somebody. Did, did you know a, a foreigner bump into his car or something like? What happened? What happened, Lee? Presumably, presumably, you used to be a good person, but then something changed. I'm great. I'm great cook. <laughs> um, waiting for him. Waiting for him. Turning up on a big off. <laughs> Uh, oh my god, does he seriously think that cooking skills is passed down through genes? <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness, no, it's just, it's pathetic. Anyway guys, we're almost at the end of stream. I just want to cover one final story here um, from Channel 4 News about childcare. The tax burden is at its highest level in 70 years and will be rising in each of the next five years of the forecast period. In fact, by the end of that period, the average family will be £870 worse off. That's when you take into account both the national insurance cuts, but also the freezing of the thresholds for income tax and national insurance. You've mentioned the freezing of tax thresholds then. So are you going to unfreeze them? Well, look, I'm under no illusions about the scale of the challenge that I will inherit if I become Chancellor. Taxes have become so high under this Conservative government because they've failed to grow the economy. And that's what is needed now. We need economic growth. Because that's the way. You're unveiling a poster today that says the Tories are giving you a kicking on on tax because they've frozen tax thresholds. And that's terrible. But yet you're not willing to unfreeze them yourselves. You're saying that you could give us that same kicking. I will not make any commitments without saying where the money's going to come from. That's one of the reasons why we're in the mess we are in today. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the two-child benefits limit. Just last week, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown said, quote, the two-child rule is inequitous, 
The majority of three child families are now in poverty and that's a terrible indictment on our country. Will you scrap that policy? Well, as I said, I'm not going to make any commitments without saying where the money is going to uh, come from because the people who pay the price when you pay fast and loose with the public finances is ordinary working uh, families. You know as well as anyone that tax and spending is... Oh my goodness. So, it, look, when it comes to the t to the two-child cap, it means you're going to punish the poorest in society. Like, the... The response from many many on the right and some others will say, well, you know, if you, if you can't afford to have these children, then, then don't have them. But you, this policy, this approach is actually punishing the parents, punishing the children, not the parents. If, if your goal is to punish the parents, you're not going to do it this way. You're punishing the children. The children didn't ask to be born. The children are going to suffer by cutting this benefit for them. Um, th th I, I can't see how this can be justified. Like the... the the attempt to justify it is saying, well, you're going to punish the parents. Okay, but it's too late now. The, the children exist. So why are you punishing the children? Uh, a game of priorities. You could say right now that your priority is to scrap this rule on a two-child benefit limit and bring hundreds of thousands of families out of poverty. You can make that your priority right now. You could just say that you well, do and you'll find the number. money somewhere. Enough find the money somewhere. I mean, that sounds very Liz Truss. Um, I'm not going to take that approach. I'm going okay, we'll get back to them in a moment. Gary, thank you so much for that super chat. How do mum and dad teach their kids to cook, uh, to budget, cook, maintain a household when each of each uh, work two jobs and are barely have a life of their own? Spoils, they can't. Yes. Like this idea, well, parents need to take more responsibility. It's not the responsibility of government. This, of course, is then what's the point in having a government if it doesn't look after people, if you're just offloading everything onto the public? So, well said, yeah. But it's about, you know, the government are happy to take responsibility for some things, but not for everything. And, you know, it's when it's, it's convenient, they'll say, well, it's, you know, parents need to, um, to take responsibility for their children. I'm going to make sure but that you everything... can make it your priority. You can well, say right now, let me tell that's you about, my priority. Let me tell you about some of our priorities. Uh, we would get rid of the tax breaks, which means at the moment, private schools don't pay VAT or business rates. And we put that money, every single penny of it, into um, young people at our state schools, where 93% of kids... But we're talking about a very small amount of money here. It's the same with the non-DOM tax status. You were talking about, we're going to get rid of the non-DOM tax status, and this is going to allow us to hire thousands of doctors and nurses. We're talking about two or three billion pounds. This is, is nothing in comparison to what you actually need. ...are educated. We would get rid of the system where private equity bosses don't pay income tax on their bonuses and we would put that money into frontline public services. Those are Labour priorities and I think they are also the priorities of the British people. Well, let's do a quick fire round. So as of the 1st of April, a parent with a two-year-old is eligible for 15 hours of free childcare. Are you going to be keeping that? We will deliver the entitlements that the government have set out. That's great. That's a yes. That's a yes. But, we'll keep, we'll keep but, the yes. But, okay. But, then there will be an extension uh, to working parents uh, well, over the nine I, months from September. I think I've September. just answered all your questions. We are committed to the promises that parents have been made. One of the promises from September 2025, which is well after the well, next Paul, election. I've just answered all of your questions. We will honour the commitments that have been made to parents. So the 3.30 hours a week from September 25. Yes or no, are you committing to that? I just have already committed. So that's to a all, yes. yes, that's but, a yes, but great. But Paul, if you listen to the <laughs> answers, I'm committing that we will honour the commitments uh, that have been made to parents because parents need to be able to... <laughs> it's like we're, we're, we're honouring the commitments we've made to parents. What are those commitments? We're honouring the, the commitments. Plan for the future. I've got one last one for you. Okay, when you sat there during the budget and you look up and there's the Chancellor announcing a brand new policy which is nicked straight from your book on scrapping the non-don tax. What went through your head at that moment? Well, it shows that we're winning the battle of ideas. Come on, was there not a moment of, oh God, that was gonna raise us loads of money? Well, look, you know, our imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, uh, they say. Uh, it was a good policy when we announced it several years ago. It's a good policy now. Uh, I hope the government don't, uh, I hope the government get on and implement it. And if they don't, I certainly will if I have the chance to be. Ch 
It, look, once again, these are this is tinkering around the edges. What they need to do is introduce a wealth tax. There are hundreds, there is hundreds of billions of pounds that they lying to be taken, lying around to be taken by the state. People have made millions, billions during the pandemic. Money shoveled to the private sector, to the, the to the richest in society, and now it's their turn their turn to turn around and pay. Now, unfortunately, I don't think this is going to happen because it feels like the Labour Party are not going back to their roots. What they're doing is they're going to make sure that the the richest in society are are protected, and it, maybe it's because of if we look at who's donating to the to the Labour Party, the the big donors don't want any change they want to maintain the status quo and and the fact that Rachel Reeds has who will be the f- future chancellor has said that she's going to maintain Tory spending uh spending rules then how are you going to grow the economy how are you going to uh, rebuild public services and some of the talk she's talking it seems to be also the case that everything will have to come out of day-to-day spending so there'll be no real injection of capital expenditure capital investment sorry so you need capital investment you need to grow the economy you need to fund public services and just talking about well you know stability will grow the economy that's not that's not going to happen there has to be fundamental change one issue that that they don't seem to talk about enough they mention it, but they don't talk about it, is, of course, the NHS. If there are so many people who are on the waiting list now, if you can deal with that waiting list, you can move people who are sick at the moment, who can't work, back into the economy. They will help grow the economy. But they can't because the NHS waiting list has it has dramatically increased over the last number of years. Some of it is part of the pandemic, of course, but most of it is Tory rule. Now, how are you going to fix that? You need staff. You need to bring people in from abroad. You can't wait six, seven, eight, ten years to train up doctors and nurses. You need people straight away. So you need to do something about immigration. You need to bring in more workers. How are you going to attract those workers? You need to pay them higher wages. If you want to maintain staff, you need to pay them higher wages and, and give them better conditions. That costs money. Where is that money going to come from? We're talking about a significant amount of money. Where is that money going to come from? Like, I... I understand when it comes to asking questions, the Tories and the government, when the Tories are in power, they can say, we're going to introduce, we're going to spend 500 million pounds on Rwanda. And the journalists never ask the question, how are you going to pay for it? But when the opposition say, we're going to you know, provide free school meals, the first question is, how are you going to pay for it? This question should be put to all. How are you going to pay for bringing down the NHS waiting list? Now, their response will be, well, through technology and stuff like that. But that's the tip of the iceberg. Yes, it will help reduce the waiting list using AI and technology. But we know you need staff. There are massive vacancies in the NHS and social care. Those two areas need to be sorted out. If you can't fix social care, you can't provide councils with the money to... Uh, to fund social care and and the care sector can't get the workers they need then you're going to be stuck with this waiting list so how are you going to do that i, I think it's a legitimate question and just talking about non dom status and vat on private schools is, is not going to dent that especially if like w- when it comes to money money is about retaining staff and training up new staff but when it comes to actually welcoming people in you need to change the immigration rules you need to issue more visas you need to have a more open society a more welcoming society as well so government need to to i think what needs to happen with the labor government when it comes to immigration is they need to make it positive they need to make the case for positive immigration a positive case for immigration and do a u-turn like a, a 180 on what's what's happening with the tories the Tories are, are constantly talking about, about immigration in a negative way. Labour have to do the opposite. They have to present a positive case for immigration, saying this is what immigration is about. This is how it's going to help us grow our economy. If we can grow our economy, you're going to have better public services. You're going to have more money in your pocket. You're going to have be able to deal with the cost of living crisis in a much better way if we are able to, in, if we're able to have a more positive approach to immigration. 
but there still seems to be this fear that they don't want to upset the racists and bigots in the Red Wall. And if this is the approach, then you're not going to be able to achieve the goal of bringing down the immigrant, the, the waiting list. So guys, we're almost at the end of the stream. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who came on. Thank you for your support. Thanks for your patience. Thanks to the moderators for doing a wonderful job as always. Um, before we finish, we have our one for the road. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Um, do check out the Sunday Roast. I'm back on the Sunday Roast for this Sunday. We had a, a wonderful show with uh, two wonderful guests. Do check that out. And um, if I don't see you then, I'll see you on Tuesday, same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, how, how, enjoy this and if I don't see you after, have a great weekend. First of all, I know that the ice sculpture is melting. Yes. And even though the scientific evidence is melting and the room is physically getting hotter, we can all feel it. We're not allowed to mention it, all right? We just can't talk about it. It's not real. Yeah, this is the most demeaning job I've ever had and I worked at the Willy Wonka experience, so. Sorry, Nigel said that if you left and you came back in, things would be better. Ah, no. Policy is we can't let you back in. Sorry, mate. Look, we've all been lied to about what leave means. Guys, could we just make sure that nobody mentions that the staff are mostly foreign? That'd be great. So obviously I'm from Belgium, but I'm doing an accent. Just makes it easier for everyone, doesn't it? Oh, don't look, guys, be cool. But over there, that guy, allegedly, is the Brewdog CEO. At Nigel Farage's party, that is punk. I, I mean, I've never been to a punk concert, but when you think of punk, <laughs> this is what you think of, isn't it? I wouldn't be surprised if Johnny Rotten's here. I mean, he's punk. You can't deny that, can you? Pint of red, blue and white gin? Certainly. Pint of champagne, sir? Certainly. Pint of piss, sir? Certainly. Has he uh, put food on for staff? What is it? Mackerel and sewage water? Right, well, fair play. At least he's serving British food. That's nice. Hello? Sorry? Ten years to save the West. Oh, what? From today? Or you don't know? Okay. No, I know that a slow, comfortable screw against the wall is technically a cocktail, but when you say it, Feels creepy. Okay, so Donald Trump is on a video link. That's fun. Yeah, maybe start spitting in the glasses. Yeah, maybe start. All right, everybody, drinks orders. Liz Truss wants something short, intense, and incredibly bad for you. Lee Anderson would like something rich and bitter. Holly Valance would like something that was popular in the noughties, but is now widely considered to be a shit drink. Nick Candy wants some sweets, but he won't be paying for them. The Brew Dog Guy wants a can of his new beer, which is called Cancel Culture. And Nigel would like a glass of champagne, but he'd like to pay a lot, lot more for it than he used to, and he'd like it served in a pint glass. Because even though that makes it taste a lot worse, it makes it brutal. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness have a great weekend guys i'll see you on sunday and then i'll see you on tuesday take care good night